<coughs> Kira Tato. <coughs> I'm going to give a, a short practical talk about the protection of sources, and particularly the protection of sources in an era of mass surveillance systems. And one of the reasons I want to do this is that I've heard pessimistic talk about how sources can't realistically be protected in, a, in an age of electronic surveillance and so on. I don't believe this is correct, and I think that we shouldn't, there is so much work to be done, we shouldn't be putting ourselves off with ideas like that. I should also begin by saying that there's a bit of ambiguity about what a whistleblower means and what we're protecting, and it's good to distinguish about what we're talking about. I take a whistleblower normally to mean somebody who sticks their head up, identifies themselves, and talks about something they learnt when they're inside a job. And in my case, out of many dozens of secret and internal sources, I've never had a whistleblower like that. And when people have come to me and suggested they'd like to do it, I have put them off it because I don't believe there are enough protections. And in most cases, apart from some dramatic exceptions, I think you're, giving, you're condemning someone to a life of trouble. And that's except for the dramatic exceptions, of course. So what we've got is we've got whistleblowers, but I, there's also a category which you, I, I would call a leaker, who is somebody who is going to serve a huge public service and provide information, but never be known about, do their good works, and continue with their career if they want to. And that's the kind that I'm particularly talking about now. And how we protect their identity, use the information, get the public benefit without the personal harm. <clears throat> a couple of months ago, I had six detectives arrive at my house in Friendly, New Zealand, and uh, they spent 10 and a half hours going through my house, all the parts of my house, opening all the books, going through our drawers, digging through my files, removing all the computers and hard drives and CDs and memory sticks and whatever else they could find, which is an unpleasant experience, but the point of raising it here is that they were looking for my sources and I don't think there's the slightest chance that they will find who my sources were. That's what the point of this talk is about. They were looking for the sources for a book I'd recently finished and published, which was revealing a dirty tricks campaign inside the Prime Minister's Department in our, in our country, where there had been staff who were deniable but who were being used to smear their opponents. They used um, intelligence information, which the government had access to, to, to uh, try to undermine their opponents. You had someone from the Prime Minister's office breaking inside the opposition Labour Party's computers and digging dirt on them. Very important public issues were going on there. Another interesting aspect of the, of the book from the point of view of this conference is that the information I got for that story, which was a story I'd been pursuing because people around New Zealand, and particularly political people, knew there was something particularly heavy uh, as politics coming out of the government. My source for this was an ethical hacker. And this is, a, this is a good story because I find in my personal experience that there are a great many hackers who do interesting but not very politically worthwhile work and then go off to work for banks and multinationals. And it's quite a rare and wonderful thing when there's um, important information that serves the public interest. And that's, this is one of those cases. And as I say, the point of the story is that as certain as I can be, even though we have mass surveillance systems, even though the government was very interested in, in, in me at the time and was watching me because of working on the Snowden documents, I think that my source will be, remain completely safe. Now, how do we do this? The first thing that the police did when they arrived at my house, in fact, the first thing that the police always do when they start an investigation nowadays, is they look for my mobile phone. If you've got something you need to keep secret, a mobile phone is a personal surveillance system. It says who you've been contacting and where you were. It's got time stamps on all your activities, your texts and everything else. And the police nowadays use them for most investigations and convictions. They were deeply crestfallen when they discovered, I was one of the few weirdos left who just doesn't have a mobile phone. <laughs> but it's a warning to everybody else. What we're talking about is call data or metadata, which is the records of who you talk to, what the nearest cell phone tower was, what the duration was, what the time was, and so on. Which is a fantastic investigative tool. If we could have it for our work, we'd love it. The police love having it too. The police don't bug many phones these days. It's too labour intensive, but they go back and back to that call data when they're investigating leaks, car thieves, or anything else. And so there's a simple answer to this, 
And that is that if we want to protect the source right from the beginning, we can't leave any electronic tracks at all. You just don't do it. You just never text them. You never email, you never email them. You never phone them from a mobile phone. If you have to phone them, wait till you're visiting your obscure aunt and do it from there. But if we don't leave the tracks, it means when we get to publication day, we will hopefully not have to sweat about it. The next thing that the police went for in the house, unsurprisingly, was the computers in the house. And they grabbed them all, and at the moment they're sealed in the Auckland High Court with a legal battle going on about whether they're allowed to get hold of them. But once again, I am sleeping easy about it. And the main reason I can sleep easy is because there's nothing on the computers, and when the book was coming out, I secure wiped them multiple times. But anyway, I've got encryption on my hard drive. And <clears throat> encryption on the hard drive to some people might still sound like a difficult thing, but it's actually compulsory and simple in the modern age. But if you haven't done it before, probably the best way you could lose your data is not by the police coming, but by scrambling your own data. And so, what I've, this is an, one idea I'd like to, to bring here, is that one of the important parts of my work for more than the last 10 years is that I have entered into a series of incredibly productive relationships with people whose full-time full jobs is in IT, in particular in information security. Hackers. People who are some kind of hackers. And I think that for me, this has enhanced my work immensely. It's helped me at the information security level, which is to do with my own encryption and encrypting my hard drive, but also helps me to study certain stories, to dig into data I've been given, to work out the formats of interesting information I've been given, but which I can't access. And the idea, the idea I'd like to suggest here is, as part of the idea of this particular conference of investigative journalists and hacktivists, is that I think there should be an ongoing one-to-one -one collaboration set up for all sorts of people who are doing investigative journalism, that it would deeply enhance our work to be working with people who have got, who've got hacker skills. Now, what are the characteristics of IT people? It's just it's a very nice synergy because IT people are often kind of anti-authoritarian. You'll notice from all kinds of organizations, they've got skills. They develop this because of their skills they've got, which most ordinary people don't have. And they're often quite politically motivated. They know about the world and they think about the world. And then they get on with their IT stuff without necessarily very useful outlets or productive outlets in terms of the politics of the world. And so I'd like to suggest that there's a project that we all consider and actually try to build up, that we have mechanisms for recommending trustworthy IT people to trustworthy investigative journalists and, and other reporters to make them into teams who work together on worthwhile projects. As I say, I do this. It has enhanced my work immensely for many years now to have that person there who is collaborating with me and bringing extra tools and extra insights into what I do. However, having said this, even in the age of mass surveillance, the most important tools for protecting sources are the pre-digital ones. The first and most important is that most people can't keep a secret. There's a science to keeping secrets. And if we want to, keep, if we want to have sources, then we need to understand the dynamics of secrets. And I'm, I'm going to tell you a very obvious answer to this. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> and, and this might sound obvious, but journalists like lawyers and other so-called careful professions are the biggest blabbermouths around. And the physics of secrets is that if you tell one more person, just one person, and then they tell it to somebody who feels even less responsibility to the secret, then your secrets accelerate away from you. And if you're working on things which are juicy and exciting, actually everyone wants, everyone wants to know a bit of the story. And so the simple answer is, when I meet a source the first time, I say to them, we are going to put a ring fence around the two of us, and no one else will ever know about this till the day I die. And that way, again, I can sleep easily. And this is very important, that actually that is how you keep a secret. It doesn't make a great party story, but it's how you keep a secret. The next thing is that right from the beginning, it's too late when you, when you come up to publish to realise the mistakes you made at the beginning. Right from the beginning, you have to contact people and meet people and continue to meet people in ways which leave no other kind of tracks in the world. For example, don't ask your friend to introduce you if you don't want to have your friend part of that uh, circle later when it becomes interesting and controversial. In other words, Right, care right from the beginning is important. And it's already been mentioned once before, but the other area which I perhaps spend half of my effort on when I'm writing, when I've finally finished the investigating, is about what information you write down. Because to the reader, 
they're just hearing an interesting story, but to the invest to the to the um, security officer of the agency you've written about or the company you've written about, every piece of information that you write is points on a grid to try to, to zero in and triangulate in on your sources. He seems to not know anything before this date. He seems to know nothing after that date. He knows what's happened in this section, but not with that interesting thing that happened across the hall. In other words, when I'm writing, I'm constantly thinking, how can I take the information I have and make it as if I'm looking from a different direction, the shadows are going in different ways, and different things are being emphasized. And I, some, sometimes I leave out huge swathes of interesting information, because otherwise I won't protect my sources. And sometimes, if I've got such a brilliant one, one source thing for a piece of information, I'll put tremendous effort into finding more information from a different source, I call it diversionary detail, which I can mix together with that to help protect the source, because otherwise it's not usable. And again, if we do that properly, we leave the, the people who come after us trying to investigate with their heads spinning and just bemused about how we managed to get the information. <clears throat> Final point, I'm just going rattling through quickly here. Final point, I wonder whether this recent history of stunning leaks like Chelsea Manning and Edward Snowden have created an idea that the way that we get fantastic leaks and in information to, in, to inform the public and to, to bring to life issues and to bring about change on wrongdoing is that we wait for some incredibly brave whistleblower to step forward. We might have to set up an anonymous uh, an electronic mail, secure mailbox or something, and then we wait. But that's not what investigative journalism is about. Most information which comes to me spontaneously is kind of interesting, but it's not what I need to be working on. And investigative journalism is about our own focused, strategic work of seeing questions that need to be answered and lies that need to be um, undone and issues which need to be brought to life. And the way you work on those is not waiting for a whistleblower. It is by actively going out and searching for people and strategizing and thinking, how many places can this information be? And within that organization, there's not just the PR person, there's the former staff and the junior staff and the allied organizations and drawing a map of all the places and then waiting for that interesting magic that happens when you're searching strategically, which is that you get lucky and something comes along because you've been searching for it. And so the point I'm trying to make is that we don't, while, you know, thank God for Edward Snowden and so on and for Chelsea Manning, but the main work we do is where we go searching ourselves and we don't want to think that with the, the job of investigative journalism is waiting for the next big hit. And to finish, what I would say is that, um, in summary, as long as we do that job, and as, we're, as long as we're persistent, and as long as we understand the risks, even in the age of mass surveillance, and we take sufficient care, I believe that there will continue to be good sources, and that the well, the well of these good sources is not going to dry up. Thank you. <laughs>